Great, okay, um, we'll get started. I think um, Jane might come, uh, Jane Arch might come a little bit later, but um, welcome everyone to the inaugural uh, session of the English, English Research Seminar Series, uh, which we'll be doing all throughout the year. So um, we have um, Professor Barry has come all the way from Aberystwyth uh, to start off, to kick us off in the best possible way. Um, and so we'll be having these research series, um, which you're all welcome to uh, throughout the year and obviously I'll be advertising them. Uh, we'll have one towards the end of this term, which will be Jane Archer actually talking about her project that she's working on called Literary Bedfordshire, or Literary Bedford. Um, but I'll advertise that in due course, and that should be, I think, on the 9th of December, but again, as I'll advertise. So yeah, welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor Barry uh, to start the session. I've written a little introduction, uh, which is slightly involved, but um, hopefully you'll um, forgive me for doing it. Uh, but it's sort of trying to speak to some of your ideas. Uh, throughout your work. And then, um, so uh, it's my intention uh, today, right now, to enact a brief introduction uh, to Professor Peter Barrett from Aberystwyth, uh, his work and his talk on the ends of literary theory. So you know that it's my intention, as I'm telling you that this is what I'm doing. You know that every part of this introduction, its conceptual play, its bad puns, its witty aside, and its bibliographic outlines, will contribute to the enactment and characterization of what is commonly described as an introduction. In so claiming, I'm enabling you to avoid getting trapped by and otherwise burdened with accusations of an intentional fallacy, um, of attributing intentions to me that are fallacious. And I'm telling you that this is an introduction, it is what I'm doing, so it's, o it's okay to assume that this is an introduction. Um, uh, I'm also sparing you from being called, in what Professor Barry called in, a, in an important essay of 1980, the enactment fallacy. So I'm telling you that each part of this very brief introduction is directly related to the introducing of Professor Barry and his work. So your conclusions, therefore, that I'm standing here with the intention of enacting an introduction to Professor Barry's talk on the ends of literary theory are, I'm telling you, far from fallacious, but this is what I aim to do now. So the intention, the intention of my laboured opening is to somewhat recklessly draw attention to some of the literary critical questions um, Peter, if I may, um, has explored throughout his career. So the 1980 essay, The Enactment Fallacy, Peter takes aim at practice common since the bad old days of I.A. Richards and new criticism, of peddling the belief, as he puts it, that in a good poem, most elements of the sound patterning are directly related to meaning, to which ideally they offer implicit support by enacting, miming, or embodying the sense. Um, come on. Uh, um, as Peter suggests, such critical practices complacently and naively conflate formal practices with content and sacrifice what he calls context and response as legitimate foci of attention for the image and objectification of the poem as a kind of perfect organism ossified out of context by the sheer will of aesthetic closure and transcendence. Peter spent a long and illustrious career calmly, diplomatically, and brilliantly dismantling what he calls in relation to J. Hillis Miller's classic 1972 study Victorian poetry, the authoritative and confident claims of not only the legacies of new critical thinking and practical criticism, but latterly of any literary critical practice which sacrifices clarity, close reading, and awareness of context of literary production for the bewitching balms of practical or theoretical positioning. Indeed, the word, thing, activity, and concept of concept seems to me to be a uniting theme throughout Peter's work. Have you checked your context? Might, be, might read a Peter Barry t-shirt, I don't know, might, you know <laughs> reminding his interlocutors to check their default frameworks at the door of both close and generalized reading. So Peter's critical engagement with hermeneutics um, has been over a long career and, and sort of came to a culmination, I think, in the book's length intervention, uh, literary, literature in contexts, um, in which he sort of um, uh, intervenes in the debates around new historicist readings versus formalist readings. Um, Peter's sense it's a kind of polemical response, I think, to Peter's sense of the then and now prevailing literary critical orthodoxy as entrenching new historicist legacies, whereby the insights of historicization and contextualization were advanced despite the practices, concomit uh, the practices concomitant production of a kind of blindness towards literary locale. So literature in context seeks to kind of liberate literary criticism from its reliance on the either-or practices of formalism and historicism and seeks to refine the definitions of different types of contexts, and to 
uh, inaugurate a kind of critical reading which is con context sensitive, not context free or context saturated. And this um, uh, runs throughout this. Um, so such a diplomatic approach to literary critical practice is motivated, I think, by Peter's career-long commitment to teaching literature and to enabling students, peers, and the public to approach literature in pragmatic, practical, and informed ways. And such pedagogical, humanist, and I would suggest politically informed practices would produce the excellent beginning theory, uh, English in practice, the pursuit of English studies, the wonderful historical survey, uh, poetry wars, British poetry of the 1970s, and the battle for Earl's Court, and it really was a battle for Earl's Court. And of course, um, his insightful reading poetry, which I wrote to Peter about, uh, about a year ago and said, can you help me with uh, developing my own course in poetry and poetics after reading your reading poetry? And of course, Peter was uh, very diplomatically uh, wrote back and gave me some excellent advice, so thank you for that. Um, I met Peter when I was studying to do a PhD, uh, well I wanted to do a PhD at Aberystwyth and he introduced me to lots of different uh, theories and I always return to beginning theory in my lectures and to Peter's work as a kind of reminder of the sort of generosity of spirit that uh, exists in literary critical uh, discourse and in teaching actually. So my intention to enact an introduction to Peter's work and career has been somewhat fulfilled although the intentionality of my original gesture as foreshadowed in the introduction to my own introduction overstated the scope and possibilities of my actual enactment. As such, there is a critical distinction between my intention and my activity, which reveals the contradictory or fallacious nature of intentionality itself. Similarly, what I enacted, both on paper and in performance, were not the enactments I had intended. I thought I would be funnier, for example. <laughs> and my intention to have certain sections rhythmically reinforce the content was perhaps lost in the garble of the performance itself. Nevertheless, it is a pleasure to end my um, literary theoretical illustrations, bibliographic outline of Peter's work, and genuine praise and thanks for him being here to simply welcome Professor Barry uh, to talk to us aptly about the ends of literary theory. Professor Barry. Um, th thank you very much indeed, Gareth. I'm, I'm, I'm very um, flattered that you took so much trouble over that. Um, it, 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 it's like having my whole life sort of <laughs> scrolling in front of me very rapidly, which means that I might be drowning or something, I suppose. So it's also slightly um, worrying. I, I just remember that that, um, that piece called The Enactment Fallacy, um, which was accepted by Geoffrey Hill, you know, that seemed kind of fantastic. Um, so I can kind of remember every moment about it. But it also had a predecessor, which was short, um, only three pages, and it was called How, How Not to Read a Poem. Um, but I kind of realised there's something a bit too stark about that. Mm. Um, so, um, so that's why I wrote the enactment, and I've collected more examples and so on. Anyway, thank you very much. It was, it was brilliant. Um, so um, th this talk is on um, the, the ends of literary theory, is what it should actually say. I, I missed out the word literary. Um, which kind of seems odd, although in a way that's the history of literary theory, that um, for about 35 years we just left out the word literary accidentally. Um, and I suppose part of the, um, you know, there's some of the books you mentioned, literature in context and so on, like what I'm trying to do is to put the literary back in, in a way, it sort of drops out fairly easily. Um, but anyway, I've done it myself, it says the ends of theory. Um, and it should say the ends of um, literary theory. Um, can I skip the slide? Um, I, I'm going to um, to talk about Henry James. I, I don't know how much of Henry James's work that you've um, studied, um, but, but I'm, I'm just going to focus on one particular um, story. Um, so I'm just reminding you there of his date, 1843 to 1916, American, and then just because it's so easy to forget how many different spheres um, he, he wrote in. But American novelist, a short story writer, um, in a way I think I'd, I'd rather read um, the stories. I always have wanted to read the stories more than the novels. I mean, I read the novels as well but the kind of pleasure of the stories is, um, is sort of unique. I mean, you, you were mentioning about teachers, and that goes back to a particular person um, who, who taught me, um, you know, who, who was kind of passionately 
devote it to Henry James's short stories. Um, and then late, later on I realised that actually the travel writing is, is just superb and it kind of dovetails with the, the fiction as well. Often you get the same scene um, happening um, in reality or you can see the shadow of the scene that is in one of the, the stories. And then playwright. Playwright should be written perhaps in um, one of those, like a kind of spooky looking script or something. Um, because one of the, um, the worst periods in Henry James's life was the five years, five to six years, um, as a mature man in his fifties, um, that he devoted to trying to learn um, how to write drama for the stage. Um, and it, it ended in a catastrophic and traumatic failure, um, with, which I'll talk a little bit about, as, um, as many other people have. Um, and then also auto autobiographer, um, I mean, I, it, I can kind of, it's familiar to me how the, the past, you know, just seems to, um, to come back, but also um, not just as like a, like a, a memory on the screen or something, um, but actually kind of like replay, you can go back into moments and relive them and so on. Um, and Henry James started to, to write a kind of comprehensive biography. Um, when he was um, in his 60s. Um, so the one I'm going to use is A Small Boy and Others, which is the first, obviously. Um, and then the, he, he completed a second volume, which takes you into um, adolescence and beyond. Um, and then the third one was to be called The Middle Years, which is, he also wrote a story called The Middle Years. Um, and that's the one that he died without completing. Um, I, I heard someone say recently, it's, it's terribly sad, like when, when he was on his deathbed and sort of losing consciousness, um, his, his hand was still making writing movements across the sort of counterpane of the bed. So clearly, you know, in the mind that was sort of receding from life, you know, there, there was another character, the writer, sort of standing behind him and kind of recording that going through those motions, I mean literally going through the motions. Anyway, so, so the focus then, the short story, The Author of Beltraffio, um, I'm, I'm just giving dates there as well, um, and then I, I just want to point out that in some ways notoriously, Henry James revised um, his whole output um, for a big collected edition, kind of tombstone edition, I suppose you might call it. Um, 16, 18 volumes um, in 1907, and some people have been very critical of the revisions that he made. Um, but I, I think there's, there's, there are points to be made on both sides. I'll look, look upon a couple of um, instances. Um, and I've just put the picture of Tom Baker. Tom Baker was the first Doctor Who, or the second? Or the fourth, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, I'm anyway, there, there he is, anyway, um, play, playing the um, dramatised version of the story in 1977. Um, it, it, it's in sections. Um, I always like to put talks into sections. Um, and if, it, if, if you're writing an essay or something, like it, it's very sensible to have um, sections which are all more or less the same size. Um, but actually I never kind of manage that in, in lectures and talks and things. So some of the sections are very short. Um, but, and it starts with this um, a quotation, uh, don't make a scene. Um, and then I try and just define some characteristics of the technique I'm trying to um, to use at the moment, um, and I, I got this word texicology, just sort of like fell out of the sky. But now I realise that actually I know where it came from. Um, I'll mention it when we get to it. But te texicology is a kind of deep text um, approach, um, but not just the words on the page. So like it's sort of keeping a foot in the theory camp and the um, the, the sort of 
textual cap at the same time. That's what it's trying to do. And then another question, um, a question rather, who was Rose Shirley? Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you who she, she was. And then it ends with the ends of theory. Um, I, I, I do think I'll try and be very clever and end with the beginnings of theory. Um, but that got too convoluted. I mean, it, it's one of the things that happens. Um, and I suppose um, Henry James sort of um, helps to remind us how it can happen. That the, everything is always there too. So don't make a scene is the first of the, um, the sections. Um, and and th 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 this is about the moment, according to Henry James, um, when he realised he wanted to be a writer, which usually means that he realised he already was a writer, um, like in, in his mind somewhere. Um, and, and it comes from a small boy and others. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to quote the bit there in, in, in red. Um, the, the bit in black just sort of tells you the circumstances. Um, so he's 11 years old and then he's staying um, with his father at Uncle Augustus's place. I mean, th these are very well-to-do, um, you know, upper-middle-class American um, families. Um, so the whole clan is gathered. And, it, it, he doesn't describe it as such, he calls it a passage. Um, but it's interesting the way a passage is also like a, a section in the text. Um, but I think it, it's what I would think of as like a gallery. They're sitting in some sort of rather long gallery with pictures and so on, um, in, in a very well-to-do um, house. And there's a moment when Uncle Augustus says to James's cousin, Mary, um, it's time for you to go to bed, and then and she protests, and um, James's impression is that um, he sees a flutter of my companion across the gallery, um, as for refuge in the maternal arms. So when her, when she hears her father say that, she sort of flashes across to, to her mother, um, and the, what her mother says to her is, "Come, my dear." Um, don't make a scene. Um, and Henry James had never heard that expression um, before. Um, and it, it, I mean, this, this is late Henry James, like, and also it's late, late Henry James. So the, the prose, often you really have to kind of untangle it, um, which is great to do. Um, but what he seems to be saying was, you know, that's the moment when I realised that's what you have to do if you were right. You have to make a scene. In other words, it's not, you know, what George Eliot and then later Henry James used the same. You, you don't tell it. You, you, you have to show it. You have to embody it. Um, and he's like, from that moment on, he says, um, that, that he knew what he wanted to do. Life at these intensities clearly became scenes, but the great thing, the immense illumination was that we could make them or not as we chose. So if you're a writer, you have to select. You don't um, make scenes out of everything. There are parts of a story where you're just telling, and then there are other parts where you, you have to make a scene. You have to be performing something as if it's on the stage in the reader's um, head. And he says, the mark had been made for me and the door flung open. Uh, the passage, that's where he uses passage instead of going. The passage, gathering up all the elements of the troubled time, had been in itself a scene. So th that's the moment he becomes the writer. And you know, that, that figure that sort of flits from the mother to the from the father to the mother um, is one that you see reversed actually when we come to it in uh, traffic there's a, a sort of darting movement that wants to go the other way. Um, so that's don't make a scene. Um, and I suppose you know what you might think is you could imagine a life that's sort of driven. Like if you think well, I can do it on the page, but what if I could do it 
on the stage, you know, where I, the audience would be kind of, you know, reacting. I'd hear. Do you see what I mean? Like, it's, uh, he can only imagine how the reader is reacting to the scene. But you can imagine, I think, how easily a writer becomes kind of driven by that idea. Now I want to do it on the stage. Anyway. Um, so that, that was the first bit. Um, so text ecology. Um, the, I, I, I just, as I said, I thought of this term for um, a way of trying to study literature. Um, which isn't entirely theoretical and isn't entirely textual, but is getting the two to kind of talk to each other all the time, swap things. Um, and the, um, it's sometimes it's difficult to remember the exact sequence. The, the phrase that I found very helpful was Marina Warner. Um, it's in London Review of Books. She talks about, she says, you dig digging the archaeology of the story. You, you, you have to, it's not just on the surface, you have to dig, and then there are other layers and other texts that are related, and you, you have to go down, like, you know, be, beneath the, the Norman building, you know, there might be, um, like, uh, a building, a prehistoric building, and then beneath that, and so on, like, you've, got, you've got to keep digging the archaeology. I thought it was a marvellous phrase. And then actually, she doesn't actually do it in the piece where I got the phrase from. But I, a couple of weeks ago, she, it's just brilliant, that piece called Those Brogues. It's about a pair of shoes that her, what is she, a maternal aunt, I think, owned. Um, and she tracks all the, like, where does the word brogue come from? What can it mean? How is it used by different people? And so on. It shows a picture of it. Anyway. Th that's all, not quite the current issue, but um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, what, what does text ecology do? Well, um, it's considering words and phrases and echoes, but on and off the page, like not just the words on the page. The words actually that are significant or related might be on other pages. Um, so I've got this little list, like. So in, in textual, considering in textual, so like things echo with other bits of the text. Um, but also um, there are contextual echoes. I'm going to try and sort of just show some of those in the case of Beltraffio. Good co-textual. The, the, these two, I'm, sometimes I think I invented co-textual. But when I look it up, um, sometimes it's me and sometimes it's someone else, but um, I think you know intertextuality you're kind of familiar with, you know, is when um, like a motif or something, or possibly actual phrases from um, different kinds of text um, sort of talk to each other, echo each other. But co-textual, I, I just thought that, like for instance, Henry James this story, the author of Beltraffio, it's one of about at least ten stories, which are all about a young male writer meeting an old, a, a young male aspirant writer meeting an older, established male writer. I mean, there's always a kind of strong homoerotic um, sort of tension or atmosphere um, to them, but there are at least ten of those. Um, and the the best place to, um, to find, I've got the book somewhere, um, is a book called The Figure in the Carpet, which I'm sure you'll have in the library, which is, the, the, fi the Figure in the Carpet is the name of one of those books, one of those stories. Um, so, like, you can read um, eight of them together, edited by Frank Kermode. Um I remember teaching this, I taught them once. Um, this is going back to... Um, to NSU, we had a very similar lecture theatre. I, as I came in, I had that sort of deja vu, but um, this was a session after lunch, and um, someone, she'd obviously been in the bar at lunchtime, but she said, look, they're all the same. You know, they're just all the same, it's the same story again and again. I had a sort of 
preferential. I said, you're absolutely right. That's the attraction. They're all the same. Um, and, um, you know, if you read them together, you see little shifts in the motif. You can count the elements. And, uh, and, and I did an article, um, sort of chronically dedicated to her, which was about that way of reading. You know. anyway. um, so, but, but contextual connections, then, with other writings by the same person of a similar type. That's contextual. Um, and then using key passages, passages, that word again, like you, you, you sort of hone in on something, home in what looks like a crucial moment. Um, and then you don't have to talk about the whole thing, actually keep narrowing it down. Um, again, this goes back to something I saw. I saw a session, a brilliant session, 20 years ago. And the method this um, lecturer was using, she, they were doing a Lawrence novel. She asked them, you know, which is the, um, the most crucial chapter, and then they have to agree, then they focused on that. Then she said, which is the most crucial paragraph in this chapter? Um, and then they all had more discussion, and then it just kept getting smaller and smaller. Then she said, which is the crucial sentence? And I, I, was, I was starting to get dizzy, because I was just sitting in and listening to the session, and then she said, um, uh, uh, now tell me which is the, the crucial word? So like you just keep going closer and closer. It, it's like something um, Isabel Armstrong said, how close is close? Like you talk about close reading, but how, how close is close? You know? um, and if you get close enough, you kind of go through the word somehow. Um, and, and the whole thing kind of suddenly opens out into a vista. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm getting a bit... Um, and then exploiting, anyway, the full density and complexity of textual presence. As I started using that term, it's a bit pretentious, total textuality. Um, but then I, I got a bit embarrassed about how um, sort of pretentious it is. But the, the idea of downscale um, was important. Hexacology is a practical sort of downscale of the traditional essay type theory meets text, you know, like, so you say, um, I, I, I'm going to do, um, um, like, a postmodernist reading of a uh, portrait of the artist, whatever it is. Um, so the first part of the essay is explaining postmodernism. Um, it's like they're always broken back, and then you come to the text, and then it, like, it turns out miraculously, but inevitably. Um, that what the theory says is true, and you can see the text doing that. So, I mean, I, I, I just take that. Like, you're, you're trying to take the whole of postmodernism and apply it to the whole of um, Portrait of the Artist. I just find it futile. Um, oh, what I do, the an exercise we've been doing for the last couple of years in our theory course, you know, we say, look, here's a paragraph from Derrida's. Um, dissemination or whatever. Um, and, and here's um, like the third and fourth verses of such and such or something like that. Um, we, we, we want you to show how you can use something from the, um, the paragraph of theory um, to explain something, enlighten something in that little bit of text. Like, so it's kind of that drive towards minimalizing and, and I've just found it like so don't write about the text write about part of the text don't, don't try to apply Derrida find a sentence in Derrida or a paragraph um, and, and like kind of work at it <coughs> the one I found um, this is um, a, a strange sentence but it, I was kind of reassured that a lot of people have singled it out. I hadn't realised they had. I thought I discovered it again. Derrida says, a text is not a text unless it hides from its first comer, um, from the first glance, the law of its composition and the rules of its game. I mean, there's a sort of strange metaphor of coyness or something 
in there, but it's, it's quite interesting. Like a, a text is something where you don't get everything immediately. That, that, that's what a text is. But the, um, it goes on, actually. I only quoted the bit that um, a text remains, moreover, forever imperceptible. A text remains forever imperceptible, it says. Its laws and rules are not, however, harboured in the inaccessibility of a secret. It's not just a matter of unearthing the secret under the text. It's more a matter, actually, of the rules and laws. They're very strange um, words, in a way. So the text that someone sat down and freely wrote actually has rules and laws underneath it. Um, and then it, it is simply, he says, the word simply is odd, it's simply that they, they can never be booked um, in the present into anything that could rigorously be called a perception. So you don't end up with a clear single perception <coughs> that sums up the story or even that kind of gives you its essence. You know. what, what you end up with is a kind of shimmer of perception or something. You know, there's, there's something there and you're kind of groping Toward, and that's a very familiar feeling to me, I must say, with reading, especially reading something like um, Henry James. Um, but, you know, when, when he says something, nothing that could rigorously be called a perception, like we should be talking back. Well, do you mean that it could possibly or partly be called a perception? Um, what do you mean, what would be rigorously calling something something? Um, see what I mean? Like we, 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 we never seem to, to do that. We should be talking back. Um, and, and again, that's one of the things that I always try to encourage. Like, talk back. You know, they don't know everything. Um, don't give them a free ride. Sort of ask them, get them to say um, more. Um, anyway, so that, that's. The sentence I use, that's the bit of um, the, uh, the theory, and, um, and this is, um, okay, I'm going to show the little passage now that, that, that I use. Um, the, the, the term toxicology is meant to imply that it kind of almost sounds like toxicology. So you could take it too far. If you, if you overdose on it, it's dangerous. I mean, so place a pharmacy, a pharmacon, um, in, in Derrida's book. That's the thing. It's the cure. Um, but it can also be the word for poison. Um, I mean, I suppose, like, you know, most things, if you take the medicine in the proper way, it will cure you. It can cure you. If you take it in the improper way, it can probably kill you. I mean, like the two, the two um, uh, functions are kind of related to each other. It, it has power um, in, in the world. Um, and, and that's really just um, that's really just saying what, what I've said um, already, e except the middle bit. Um, where I, I suspect that when I was sort of starting to teach theory, um, and certainly in the 80s and 90s, um, the assumption was that the theorist was always right, you know. So they always exposed there was some weakness in the text. They always knew better than the author. Um, and I started to say, you know, what, what is happening is that the the immovable object um, of the literary text meets the, um, the cutting edge of theory. Um, and actually, if the contest can go either way. I mean, you know, some, some theories just sort of slice up the text and it just becomes kind of um, ventriloquial. It just starts proving that Derrida is right. I mean, what, what, what's the point of that? 
um, I mean, sometimes it happens the other way. I mean, the cutting edge, but if it strikes a stone or something, it just gets bent. You know. I mean, cutting edge, what, you know, that, that sort of loaded metaphor. So, so what, what, what I try to say is just that it's just unpredictable. Sometimes you think, yeah, that, that theory is so subtle. Um, you know, it's really helping me to see more in the text. And then other times you think, this text is so subtle. It's making me see that actually that theory is slightly crude. I mean, like it can go either way, that's all. It's not a foregone conclusion. Um, so, anyway, we're finally getting to, um, to Beltraff here. Um, and I'm, I'm just sort of showing the, this, this is textual history. It's, um, some people call it textual genesis. Um, like, when you look at the successive um, developments and... Um, forms of the text. So it first appeared, the author of Beltraffio, um, in 1884, in this magazine, the, illustrate, the English Illustrated magazine. Th that, that date is 1895, but I think the cover was the same, actually. They didn't um, change the, the cover. Um, and, and you can see the way it's presented. Uh, it looks, I mean, suppose, I think all of these things kind of influence us, but the, the, the page looked almost biblical. Doesn't it? You know, you've got the illuminated first letter, and then you've got the two columns and so on. And then you've got the, the sort of um, uh, the wood cut or liner cut, whatever it is, and so on. Like, like actually all those features. And then if you're reading, if you're reading it, you know the sort of stories that magazine produces, because you get it every month or whatever. Um, and um, you know, when they, they develop a stable of authors, Henry James is one of the so, so, and it comes out in two issues um, in, um, in June and July. Um, and, and then, secondly, much later. So this is now, um, Henry James is working on hit the collected edition of all his works. Um, uh, and it comes out in, in, in 1907. Um, and all of the stories and novels have been really read by him. He's written a new preface for each of them. Um, he's decided a new kind of order, which stories to put together and so on. Um, so like, it's a massive undertaking. I mean, he made very little money from it, actually. Um, but, um, but obviously, like, it was a great satisfaction for, for, for him to, um, to see. Um, you, you may have um, read been able to read the, the author of Beltraffia before the, the session, um, but, but I'm, I'm not assuming that um, that everybody has. Um, so I'm just going to do plot spoiling, I'm afraid. Um, so the characters, um, a, a, again you've got the um, confrontation, as so often, between American and British, or English, or Italian, like American and European, as an American would say. So the, the narrator of the story, we don't get his name, um, he's um, a cultured young American man, uh, great admirer um, of authors like Mark Ambient, um, and he has managed to get a, a friend to um, who had met the author before to give him a letter of introduction. Um, and then he's been in Europe for quite a while. He keeps delaying. Often Henry James's main characters, they delay and delay and delay. Um, but eventually um, he's invited to, um, to come to the house and, and visit. Um, so Mark Ambient is the, the author um, of a novel called Beltraffio, that's his most recent one. Um, I think it says Beltraffio came out when he was 38, he's now about 40, and he's working on another novel. Um, his wife is Beatrice, Beatrice Ambient. Ambient um, we, we don't get a lot of background, it's very sparse. She's English and in some way connected with the aristocracy, it says. 
Um, but it, it doesn't tell us much. They all know it. Um, and they have um, a single child, Dolcino, and he is very beautiful. He keeps saying he's like a work of art, um, but also very sickly. Um, and he's um, seven years old. Um, and then the, the other character is um, Mark Ambient's sister, Gwendolyn. Um, and I suppose she's kind of like the closest anyone, anyone in the story gets to sort of having kind of common sense, as it were. Um, everybody else is, um, is, is, is very different from that. So, so this is the... Um, this, this is the, um, the plot. Um, Henry James says that the, he, he uses that term, the germ or the grain of a story. Like that someone says something and it gives you an idea for a story. Or they, they tell you an anecdote. And um, the remark to Henry James was actually about the Victorian writer J.A. Simmons. Um, and the person said to Henry James, his wife objects intensely um, to what he writes, and that naturally creates a tension. So, you know, he's, he's famous as a writer, his wife hates his writing and, and feels that it's morally corrupt. I mean, in Simmons's case, it, it's because there's a strong air of um, homoeroticism in all of the, the writing. Um, so his wife is very, as you might, I mean, um, is, is very sort of anxious about it. Um, so Henry James's idea is like to write a story which explores the creation, um, sorry, explores the tension created by that situation of someone whose wife despises what he writes and feels that it's like in some way emanating evil. So it's, like, it's a very extreme, it's melodrama, really. And I think the plot is um, melodramatic. So Dolcino's illness, he has some sort, it doesn't say what the illness is, um, gets worse. And in order to protect him from the baleful influence of the father, um, the, the mother starts withholding the medicine that's been prescribed um, and not allowing other people to see the child. Um, including the husband, the father, the child's father. Um, and um, eventually she excludes the doctor um, as well, and, until it's too late to, um, to save him. So, so you, you have the, the visitor is in this household um, where this strange uh, melodrama is being um, acted out. Um, so um, as the illness develops, the old family situation, the odd family situation becomes more apparent. And then the, the narrator um, allows Mrs. Ambient to take away and read um, proof pages from the, the novel which Ambient is now writing. Um, and what seems to happen is that convinces her all the more um, that this writing is evil, um, and that if, um, if, if Dottino is allowed to read it, which he will be when he's 18, um, that, that he will be, his soul will be corrupted by it. Um, so what she's doing is, like, the motive um, is that, like, to save his soul, she takes his life. That, I mean, that, that, that's the, the essence of the um, story. Um, so Dolcino dies, and the mother, obviously grief-stricken about her own role um, in his death, she, she dies herself um, soon afterwards as well. And there's a kind of tableau of where she's holding like the evil pages as she sees them. And um, you know, the, the, other, the other hand is holding the, the child, the sick child. So that's the, um, the plot. Um, and so this is the little episode that I, um, I fixed on. 
Um, so, like, this is the bit where I think Henry James is sort of self-consciously, you know, making a scene that won't just tell those things, but will dramatise them, um, make a scene out of it. Um, so they're, they're in the grounds, and the, the father wants, um, she can see that the father wants Dolcino to come and walk in the grounds with him and the, um, the visitor. Stay with me, darling, Mrs. Ambien said to the boy, who had surrendered himself to his father. Mark paid no attention to the summons, but Dolcino turned and looked at her in shy appeal. Can't I go with Papa? Not when I ask you to stay with me. But please don't ask me, Mama, said the child in his small, clear, new voice. I must ask you when I want you. Come to me, dearest. And Mrs. Ambient, who had seated herself again, held out her long, slender, slightly too osseous hand. And I, I, I've just put in um, italics. Um, just, it just makes it easier to read a couple of the, the phrases. Um, and you, you can see the, the, the word I'm fixing on um, is, I'm going to show you the passage again in a moment. The, that word osseous sort of stands out as, as, as very so. I mean, literally what it means is bony. I've always spelled it's bony, B O N I E or I don't know. Um, but that, it's like the sort of cusp of a textual structure. The cusp of a textual um, Or it's like an erratic boulder. It's like, you know, one of those stones which have been carried by glasses and they're, and they're put down somewhere where they don't belong. Like, so, like the word osseous, it seems to be something out of a medical treatise. Um, or a kind of forensic report, um, or something. Um, and and it, it, it occurs only once in Henry James's fiction, that word. Um, but it, it does have one other occurrence, which is in um, the autobiographical writing um, that I mentioned of Henry James. So I'm going to sort of like connect the, um, the two, look at the, the, the context of the two. Um, how is it making a scene? Um, I, I, it's, it's almost sort of Disney-esque, I think.